try again. <laughs> Good morning. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Great to uh, have you with us. And we're trusting that you're going to have an excellent time uh, worshipping God together with us this morning. We're uh, part of a local church here in Deerham. If you're regularly part of the church, welcome to you. Trust you've had a good week. Maybe you're joining us from another part of the UK or from another nation, or perhaps you're watching a bit afterwards. I hope you're having a good laugh <laughs> watching us uh, this morning. We're here to, uh, to, to focus in on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to glorify his name, to worship him, to seek him in his word. Uh, so I trust we're going to have a, a really good time. Um, let, just really one uh, kind of key thing to mention uh, for us is just the plans for next Sunday. So a little different to what we'd normally do. So we've got uh, a carol service at 4 p.m. So you'll be able to find us uh, on YouTube as usual for that. But in the morning, we're going to be breaking bread together on Zoom. So uh, you should get uh, the information for that coming through to you via the, all of the usual uh, communication channels in the church. But if for any reason you're not getting those and you want to join us, please uh, just contact us, go to the church website or even via this YouTube link and just ask to be sent that information and we'll make sure that you're a part of it. Worship team, do you want to come up and join me? Uh, I just want to read a, um, a couple of verses at the start from uh, the letter that Paul wrote to Titus. And uh, there are two things that he said. Here's the, here's the first one. It's Titus 2 and verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And uh, the Apostle John, at the start of his gospel, tells us that it was the Lord Jesus Christ that brought grace to us. So the appearing of God's grace to us is a reference to Jesus. So we could put, for Jesus has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And then Paul picks up on the same idea a bit later in chapter 3 and verse 4. And it says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. So twice Paul uh, rejoices that God has appeared to us. A bit later on we'll be going to the book of Exodus again and we're going to be reading about what I'm describing as the second most important appearing of God ever in history. Of course the first, the ultimate, the final uh, and great appearing of God that has ever happened in history to this day is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnation, the birth of God as man. The incredible story of Christmas. But as God appears to us, the purpose is that we might get to know him. So through our worship time this morning, we're going to be thinking about who God is, what God is like, what we learn from his appearing, his appearing to reveal himself to us. So let me hand over to the worship team now. Toby. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'm going to read a little bit of 1 Corinthians 13. It, um, it's often read at weddings, um, but it, elsewhere in the Bible it says that God is love. And um, I'm going to read a little bit of that. So, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Lord, thank you that you are love, and we love you, Lord. Thank you that we can approach you uh, in worship this morning. Thank you that it's you who we approach, you, the God of love. And uh, why don't you just, in your homes, where you are, maybe I've read something that particularly stood out for you about what God is like. Or maybe there's something else. Why don't you just maybe say that out loud? Maybe just dwell on it in your hearts, because that's the God we're approaching. So, Lord, I thank you for your your faithfulness to us, Lord. Thank you that the God uh, God of the heaven, God of heaven came to us, 
Lord, the, the God came to humanity so that we may come to you, Lord. And Lord, I thank you that you are faithful with us. You, you're always there, Lord. You always protect us. Thank you for that. Father, I thank you that you are a God of grace and you treat us with such kindness and love and mercy that we don't deserve. Mm. Thank you for your grace. Mm. Yeah, Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you are motivated by love. Mm. You are love. And we thank you for that, Lord. Just pour out your love on us today as we worship you. Amen. Yeah, th thank you, Lord, that you, uh, you rejoice in truth, that you, you say that you are the way, the truth, and life, Lord. Thank you that um, everything that you have said, everything that's, that's written down uh, in the Bible is true. Lord, thank you that we can sing about this truth, um, and the truth is that we're loved by you, that we, um, that we have a, a hope and a future, that we're, um, you know, we're your children, we're adopted by you. Yeah, Lord, thank you that for all of these truths that we can sing about. Thank you, Lord, that you are close to the brokenhearted you, and you Lord. save those who are crushed in spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, let's approach him in worship now.
bow our hearts, we lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, and we surrender to the truth that all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. say to some of us is are you burdened are you feeling weighed down with responsibility do you feel like you're a failure do you feel that you set out to do good but only bad came of it have you advised someone and given them advice and spoken to their lives and seen them just walk away and reject your advice well Matthew 11 says come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest Take my yoke upon you 
and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I feel God would encourage us to give our burdens to him, and take his yoke upon our shoulder. Our yoke is heavy, we can't bear it, and um, sometimes the devil will kind of get in there and kind of tell us even more bad things about ourselves, how we failed and how we failed the Lord and how we failed ourselves and we've got to recognise that the devil is a liar, there's no truth in him and he will twist the truth. So we've got to trust in God, trust that his yoke is enough for you. Where you feel that something's gone wrong, give that to God and um, let him just uh, take that off your shoulders. Maybe you're a leadership person, maybe you're in leadership somewhere, maybe you a group leader or a leader of some kind and um, God will say to you don't take upon yourself things that go wrong don't blame yourself don't constantly hark back to that failure but look to Jesus and allow that yoke that you're carrying to go on his shoulders and uh, let him lighten your burden just trust in him look to the future in hope don't look to the, the past in despair or in, or in defeat that's what I feel God is saying to you. In Mark ten thirteen to 16, it says, The people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But, when the, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like the, a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on them and blessed them. And I was pondering this verse earlier this week and I felt Father God saying to us, a young child who's got good parents automatically trusts their child, uh, their father and their parents. They don't think about where their next meal is coming from. They don't think about whether their parents love them. They don't worry about who's going to pay the bills. They trust their parents to look after them. And I felt that that is what Father wants us to do, and he wants to call us afresh this morning to trust him, to be those little children like Jesus welcomed. He's standing there waiting and welcoming us with open arms to bless us. And we've just sung that we're like children in our Father's arms. And I want to encourage you this morning to be like a child in your father's arms to trust him it may seem difficult it may seem the cares of the world are too big that you don't know all these things but but father says i am your father and i am far better than an earthly father and if a young child trusts their earthly father for all of those things and more then i want you to trust me for everything. So Father, I ask that you would help each one of us today and over the weeks and months ahead to be like little children, to trust you for everything, with everything, because you are our good, good Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next song we're going to sing talks about how the Lord can be our vision, our wisdom, our riches. So let's use this as a proclamation. Like proclaim that in your heart as you as we sing this. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. No. Oh, my. 
is done Grant heaven's joy to me Bright heaven's sun Christ of my own heart Whatever before Still be my vision hope you are the light to our feet a lamp to our path you are the wind in our sails lord you are the reason that we get up in the morning you are our destiny you are the one that loves us you are the one that empowers us you are our father as we've already heard we are your child and lord we want to come this morning and just say again how much we love you, how much we esteem you, how much we praise you, how much we exalt you, and how much we recognize that in you we can do so much, but apart from you, we can do nothing. And so we come and we lay our lives down again this morning and say, Lord, we surrender to you, to your purposes in our lives, to what you want to do through us and in us, and for us and for other people. Lord, you are our guide. We're going to sing Be Lifted Up.
It's written in the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies above proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display Norwich. (laughs) Knowledge, not Norwich. They do display Norwich though. Um, There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from its pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and make it, makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its, heat, from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Yeah, Lord, thank you that we've, mm. we've heard about and sung about so much already this morning, Lord. The, the heavens above everything, all of creation, just, just displays and proclaims your handiwork. Lord, we can't, you know, from the, from the macro to the micro, you know, the, 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 the massiveness of the universe down to the kind of the tiny uh, intricate detail of every little cell yes. uh, and beyond. Lord, it's just amazing that everything declares your handiwork. And Lord, we want to lift you up this morning. We want to mm. put you on, uh, you know, uh, put you in, in the rightful place, yes. which is at the top of our priorities in you know the center of our lives lord we want to declare this morning afresh lord that we want to lift you up in our lives we want to make you number one lord we want to commit ourselves to you again amen amen i'm just going to invite the worship team to go and take your seats Great. Well, um, good morning to you all. Um, I wonder if you have ever made a dramatic appearance. Um, I nearly made a dramatic appearance this morning by tripping over a cable and sending everything flying. Uh, Probably not the most dramatic appearance ever, but some of you have probably uh, experienced much more amazing and dramatic appearances. Uh, Perhaps uh, if you've been to a wedding and you've seen the, uh, the bride making that appearance, and all the eyes turn, everyone uh, looks, everyone wants to see and uh, be amazed at the, uh, the sight that is before them. Uh, maybe you've made a dramatic appearance when you've crashed in on a meeting that someone was having and there's like a, this tense atmosphere and you crash in and suddenly, oh my goodness, what have I done? I don't know, maybe all sorts of different dramatic appearances that we might have. In, uh, in scripture, the The word in the original language for appearing or appearance is epiphania, from which we get the word epiphany. You might have heard of that word, epiphany. It means appearing. And you might also have heard of another word, theophany, that means appearing of God. Don't worry too much about the Greek words, but we are going to be thinking this morning about the appearing of God. And as I said right at the start, just after I'd made a fool of myself, um, I said that this morning we were looking at the second greatest ever appearing of God in history, ever since the creation of the cosmos. As Sam was just speaking then about uh, giving glory in the whole of creation. Uh, ever since the day of creation, the, greatest, the second greatest ever appearing is what we're going to look at. But in the kind of forefront of our minds as well, we're because we're so close to the Christmas season, we're thinking about the greatest appearing of God in history. In uh, John chapter 1, he speaks, as it were, of the Word who made the world. John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The, the appearing of God in creation, let there be light, and there was. The uh, appearing of God then. And then in the coming of Jesus, it says in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt, and we could say with Phil last week, tabernacled, camped among us. He appeared among us. As I read those 
verses from Titus earlier. God appeared. The grace of God, the kindness of God, the goodness of God appeared in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John goes on to say, we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, like Paul said in Titus. For from his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. And then John says in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So here in John's passage, we have the creation. Then we have that second greatest appearing then in history, which is the giving of the law to Moses at Sinai. And then this kind of crescendo culmination of God appearing more remarkably, more amazingly, in a greater way, in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word. So we're looking at Exodus, so we're going to be looking at the second greatest appearance. Now, if you've got your Bible to hand, you you probably want to try and find Exodus and uh, chapter uh, 19. Uh, Just to kind of let you know of the story, or reminding you of the story, we've had the Passover, immediately followed by the episode at the Red Sea. That was in chapters 14 and 15. And then after that, there is miraculous provision. There's manna, there's uh, quail, there's uh, water made sweet, there's water from the rock. And then there's uh, an attack by the Amalekites, which God uh, defends and protects his people. And so chapter 16 and 17 record that. And then to Mount Sinai. And in chapter 18, on their way, they meet Moses' father-in-law called Jethro, who gives Moses advice about how to not try to do it all on his own, but how to set up systems systems for governing this people by delegation. And then we get to chapter 19. So the nation has hardly kind of uh, got going yet. This is early still in their history. Chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. On the third new uh, new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt... So we're just three months in. On that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. So the the picture is we've got this mountain, we've got the nation now camped before it. And what we're going to read, we can't read all of it, but from here, the start of chapter 19 to the end of the book in chapter 40, what we concern ourselves with are the appearing of God, the giving of the law, and then the implementation of a worship system led by a priesthood which is now appointed and uh, organised. And there is a tragic interruption in chapter 32, of what we might call the golden calf disaster. So, we've seen already in previous weeks how the Passover Red Sea event defined the nation. It's perpetuated an annual festival, a bit like we uh, choose to celebrate Jesus' birth every Christmas as a way of helping us just to kind of, wow, wonder about it and Easter. We we help help ourselves as churches just to kind of keep these core truths that God came as man and he came to die on the cross and we raised from the dead for us. Christmas and Easter helps us to keep that in mind. It's not commanded to us in scripture that that we need to keep it, but it's very helpful to us. In the same way, Passover, Red Sea, uh, these events define them and they're then remembered annually, perpetually in festivals. And these festivals, a bit like Christmas and Easter, have become part of our cultural background as a nation, even though people have perhaps forgotten so much of what it's about it's still there it's there's still a legacy of it in the same way their culture was molded in fact their entire self-understanding of what it meant to be Israel was kind of formed rooted in these events that they kept remembering over and over now if those things were formative for them let us also say that the giving of the law at Sinai is equally 
transformative for them. This is kind of like the other bit of the package that now forms them as a nation. These, are, these chapters in Exodus are utterly foundational for the nation of Israel and everything that is to come in the rest of the Old Testament. This defines them. And the giving of the law at Sinai through this appearing of God is known as the giving of the covenant. I know that's an unusual word. It's a word that lawyers use. It's not a word we use in every, everyday language. But it's a Bible word that you will encounter quite often. And so it's really worth having some familiarity of what it means. The covenant is where God makes a promise and he puts some kind of uh, guidelines around how it's going to work out. And so we're going to see that in a minute. It, it is a solemn promise. And the story of the Old Testament, really from, from Noah all the way through to the coming of Christ and including the coming of Christ, is understood through covenant. God making promises and he never breaks his promises. But you have to listen carefully to what the promises say. Anyway, let's have a look uh, briefly then at the, the heart of what happens in this appearing of God. I'm going to say there are kind of three things that happen that we need to get our heads around. The first thing is this, God appears. Epiphany, theophany, God appears. And in his appearing, there is some revealing of himself and he reveals his will. And his will is this, that he promises that he will be God to this people. And this people will be known as his people. That is a phenomenal and defining moment. There have been promises made to uh, Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and things of we've seen have been reiterated to Moses but now God speaks to a nation, not just a man or a family, to a nation and he says, I am going to be your God. That's my promise. You are going to be my people. And I tell you what, having this God as your God is very, very advantageous. Because he's the God of all creation. He's the God of everything. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's omnipotent and uh, omniscient and omnipresent. He's awesome. He's amazing. He's a God of tenderness and majesty. And he says, I promise I'm going to be your God. And I promise you're going to be my people. Wow, how amazing is that? That's the first thing that happens, the appearing of God. Theophany, epiphany, the appearing of God. And secondly, the giving of the law. You see, the covenant, the, the agreement comes as a package. You know when you have a wedding ceremony, typically you kind of make some promises to one another and you say what you're going to do and then kind of accompanying it, accompanying it comes some rings and the giving of the rings is designed to kind of like bring a, a bit of a reminder of what it's all about and it's kind of part of what goes on. It's, it's not a very good analogy that I'm using but in the same way the covenant is accompanied by the law. So God says, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, and you, you're, you're part of the deal. I'm going to do all the God stuff, you just have to do the people stuff. The people stuff is be faithful to me, and the law will tell you how to do it. So all you've got to do is to keep the law, and then all the promised blessings are all going to be yours. Fantastic, awesome, amazing. So it all sounds great up to this point. <laughs> the third part of the deal, if you like, is that the law not only is going to tell them how to live faithfully, but there are massive amounts of material in Exodus. If you've tried to read it all the way through, you'll have encountered this. It feels so detailed and so kind of repetitive. The other thing that happens is that there is the establishment of the priesthood and the tabernacle. Worship. And the purpose of the priesthood and the tabernacle is to maintain the covenant relationship between God and his worshipping people. The covenant needs maintenance. It's like a really great engine, but it still needs to be maintained. You've got to have it serviced each year, if you like. The covenant needs to be maintained and the maintenance is going to be done through the worship system, through priesthood and tabernacle. Let's um, look at these three things just a little bit more in the time that's available to us. So chapter 19, I'm now going to read verses 3 to 8. 
While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So here we have, if you like, the the covenant announced. There already had been a covenant between God and Abraham in Genesis 12. God had already made a promise that Abraham was going to have lots of descendants, a big people, even become a father of nations. Now, that that promise is kind of being restated, expanded and developed. He's going to be their God. They're going to be his treasured possession. Don't you love that? God is saying, I really value you. You mean a lot to me. It's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? I mean, he says, the whole earth's mine, (laughs) he says as well, but I am going to treasure you in a special way. And all you've got to do is to carefully follow my commands and then you're going to enjoy all my favour. Notice then how this covenant defines their identity as God's people. Do you see how they are described as being a kingdom of priests? So before the priesthood is installed, the nation is described as being a kingdom of priests. So it's like it's the, it's the responsibility of the entire nation to worship and serve the Lord and speak the truth in all the earth. And in a little while, God is going to set aside one tribe to be particularly responsible for the day-to-day work of that. But it's not just one tribe doing it and the others don't bother. No, worship, teaching the word of God in all the earth is the whole nation's responsibility. Secondly, they are uh, described as being a holy nation. It's not just a few of them have got to live right. All the nation are to live rightly with God. And you notice that Moses reports it to the people and they give a massive yes and amen to that. That is what they want to do. So this is the establishment of the covenant. God says, I'm going to be the people, uh, the, the God of this people. And the people basically say, yes, please, we're signing on the dotted line. Fantastic. Let's read on a bit further now from verse... Uh, 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whatever, sorry, whether beast or man, he shall not Live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Whoa. At Sinai, then, the, ma- the nation encounters the awesome presence of God. Uh, let, sorry, I meant to read a bit further. Let's pick up from verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. 
The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Wow. The nation encounters the awesome presence of God, fiery cloud, thunder, earthquake. And what happens next in chapter 20, you can see it, is they begin to receive the law. The Ten Commandments, yes, but then right uh, ordinances for right worship, for ethics, for social justice, touching on all kinds of aspects of life. Chapters uh, 20, 21, 22, 23. The, the newborn nation, only three months old, is now needing to learn how to live as God's people in God's world. As we've seen, the covenant prescribes an appointment and an equipping of a priesthood who will work in the tabernacle, which is a kind of portable temple. Phil explained about that last week. A tent for meeting with a holy God carefully constructed with a pattern, carefully consecrated through sacrifice. Ongoing worship must be done, but it must be done in an equally careful manner, just as God has directed them how to so carefully build all of these things. The nation really needs to be learning in this. That is incredibly perilous to approach a holy God in any way except the way that he has given. And so chapters 25 to 31 prescribe how they're meant to go about worship in phenomenal detail, repeated over and over to make sure you must not neglect to pay careful attention to this. And as a kind of a preparation for, be careful, be careful. They mustn't touch the mountain. They come to the foot of it, but they must not touch it or they will die. If they do as God directs, then they will live. And if they do as God directs in worship, then they can get near to God through the tabernacle that will be in their midst, as Phil reminded us last week. Friends, just a brief aside on this. Uh, We do not depend in any way, shape or form on our obedience for our salvation. We know that salvation is by grace through Jesus Christ. But there is still a principle here that we should be careful to consider God's ways as revealed to us in Scripture and then seek to live in line with them. And the effect, uh, the implications of that, as in the law given in Exodus, the implications of it are very wide ranging. They affect how we treat our neighbour, the people living around us, the people in our workplace. It touches uh, profoundly on our sexual behaviour and our attitudes towards relationships. It touches deeply what we do of our money, about prayer. It touches deeply on even how we organise ourselves as local churches. It sets priorities for us in worship and so on and so forth. Now, I don't believe that we're going to be struck down if we fail to neglect one area, but I think we, there's a lesson to learn here that God cares about such things. And if we're his people, we should be seeking to get to know his will and his ways better and better and living in the light of that. As I was thinking about this passage during the week, I was struck by some of the similarities that there are in chapters 19 and 20 with the coming of the Lord Jesus. The giving of the law, as we've read, was accompanied by cosmic signs, thunder, heavenly sounds, trumpets, earthquakes, and even angels were there, according to Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2. A bit of added detail. There were angels helping in the giving of the law. At the incarnation and the birth of Christ, there were cosmic signs. There was a star in the sky. There were angels, an angel speaking, an angel singing. At the giving of the law, Israel was terrified and Moses says to them in chapter 20, verse 18 and 19, uh, do not fear. And then the shepherds were terrified and the angels said to them, fear not, which sounds pretty much the same as do not fear. 
the law is manifested first of all in the Ten Commandments in literally ten words. Look at it, look, chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, and each of the Ten Commandments is like a word. And in John chapter 1, we're told that the incarnation took place when the word became flesh. Moses, the shepherd, has to tell people what God has said and what God has done. The shepherds have to tell what the angels have said. Moses was told in Exodus 3 and verse 12 to look for a sign. And what was the sign? The sign was when he came back to the mountain of Sinai. That was the proof. The shepherds were told to look for a sign to prove that this was true. Look for a baby in a manger. Moses twice told the people to get ready for the third day. Did you notice that in chapter 19, verses 11 and 15? Get ready for the third day. It's like, whoa. (laughs) Jesus repeatedly told his disciples to be ready for his resurrection on the third day. But then there are differences. God came on the mountain clothed in thick cloud. God came clothed in flesh in Christ. The signs on Sinai produced terror and they left barriers limiting approach. The signs at Christ's coming caused fear to turn to peace and commanded people to come in and to come near and to get close. Any who drew near to the mountain to see God would perish. The message came with warnings and produced fear. Those who drew near to the Christ child were filled with joy. The message was good news of peace. Receiving him gave eternal life. Only Moses was allowed near. Later, the elders see God's feet from a safe distance. And yet ordinary people drew near to Christ. A woman even touched his feet. She was not destroyed, she was healed. Moses told the women, uh, sorry, Moses told the people all that they must do in order to approach God. Jesus did for us all that we could not do. And so now we can safely enter in. Moses was ordered to make a curtain to separate the people from God, lest they come too near and be destroyed. Jesus' death caused the curtain to be torn and then abolished so that any of us can boldly come in. The coming of God to Sinai and the giving of the law in what happens next can either be seen as a disaster for Israel because they were offered all these benefits and yet they could not enter into them or we can look at it as preparatory for the coming of the Lord Jesus. His coming changes everything. Now we look back God coming on Sinai and the giving of the law and we see in it echo upon echo upon echo of the greater coming of the Lord Jesus and we see how in God's coming on Sinai and the giving of the law we can see just what a problem we had and what a perfect solution Jesus provides for us. Today our message has been mainly like Israel at the mountain (laughs) looking and listening in wonder at what God has done. The revelation of his holy majesty and the wondrous coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at Christmas. But let me suggest that there is one enormous application for us here. The purpose of God's covenant, the purpose of all of God's covenant promises was always to bring people safely into relationship with him. But you have to do it his way because he is such an awesome holy God. Now the world around us gets intensely offended by this because it is an exclusive claim. For years people have been saying well we're all on different paths heading up the same mountain. Friends, there is a really massive problem with this. Because as we read today, if you stray onto this mountain, you will die. No way up the mountain is safe. Any human attempt to climb up this mountain will lead to destruction and death. Someone needs to sound the warning 
Don't go up the mountain. Don't pick any of these alternative paths. You'll die if you do that. Spiritual death will resound. The thunder, the fire, the darkness, the trumpet sound, the earthquakes. These are literally repeated warnings in Exodus. And they're warnings for us. Don't go near God or you'll be destroyed. But we have an enormous, a massive, an insurmountable problem. If as human beings we cannot approach God, what are we going to do when we die? Eternal, spiritual catastrophe. What the Bible elsewhere calls hell. That is even more serious than a temporary disaster now. The appearing of God is the warning. The appearing of God at Sinai is the warning. The appearing of Christ, even though it's an announcement of good news, it is the warning that we need to heed. The giving of the law at Sinai indicates the nature of the problem. We must live holy if we are to approach God, but none of us do. The worship system of the law points to a possible solution. The lack of holiness, what we call sin, is atoned for, the price paid for, the stain washed away by substitutionary sacrifice. But the blood of the animals that die under the system of Exodus are poor substitutes for human beings like you or I. The appearing of God and the giving of the law, defining though it was for Israel, is really preparatory for the greater, more final appearing of God in the coming of Christ. He fulfills the righteous requirements of the law in a way that no sacrificial animal ever would, by his faithfulness and his obedience, even to death on a cross. Like Israel, we need to watch, listen and believe. Unlike Israel, our fate does not depend on our obedience, but on Jesus' obedience. They had to believe and then do the works of the law. We must believe and receive the benefits of the work of Christ. So as you think about Jesus coming at Christmas, as we perhaps watch films about it, as we look at the Christmas cards and the cute scenes of the nativity and all the rest of it, great and wonderful though it is, let's allow the imagery of Sinai also to come into our minds, the awesomeness of a holy God. The coming of Christ is the resolution of our problem. He comes to be the sacrifice of sacrifices. He comes to be the obedience to the law. He comes to establish a new and greater covenant where God says, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will supply the obedience for you that you could not manage yourself. Your job now is simply to receive it by faith. John said this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Friends, let's approach God in prayer now, just as we close. Lord, approaching the mountain of God meant approaching barriers. No further. Don't touch. Don't go in. Don't cross. Don't get near. Peril. Danger. Lord, this is such a picture of the awesome holiness of God and the distance, the wall of separation that there is between you and humans. 
And Lord, the law showed what we must do in order to be safe to approach you. But Lord, none of us, none of us can do that. We have all fallen short of that glory. There is not holy glory in our lives such that we can go up the mountain. We are fallen at the foot of the mountain. All in different ways. But each and every one the same. None of us better than one another. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same predicament. Lord, you've told us what we needed to do. That was helpful, but God, we couldn't do it. But Lord Jesus, you have done what we could not do. What a saviour. Every detail of the law, it just saturated with signs and symbols pointing forward to one who could do what we couldn't do, who would complete what we couldn't complete, who would fulfill what we couldn't fulfill, who would obey from the heart what we couldn't even obey externally, let alone from the heart. Jesus, you're such a perfect saviour. And Lord, we might not have understood half of what I said today. Maybe I, I've, I've made a muddle. But Jesus, faith in you, trusting in you, you that's what God the Father has asked us to do. God the Father is asking us to believe in you, to receive you by faith. So I pray, Lord, this morning for anyone who perhaps is a bit hazy, a little bit unclear in where they stand, someone who perhaps would just have to keep the barrier in place. They're afraid that if they went near to God, that would be it. Lord, for any person feeling like that, Lord, may they right now in their heart say, Jesus, I turn to you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I receive you. Jesus, I turn from going my way. I want to go your way. Lord, meet with us in our rooms. And Lord, I pray for us as a local church here. Lord, though we don't measure our performance, we don't evaluate our relationship with you in terms of scoring how we've done, Lord, because of your love for us and the love you've put in our hearts for you, Lord, we want to be diligent. We want to be careful. We want to do what you say, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you will, uh, even as we go into a new year, Lord, that we will renew our commitment to this book, Lord, to reading it, to getting to know it, wrestling with it, trying to understand it, and then to doing what it says. Lord, let this shape the way that we treat people, the way that we run our households. Lord, may the words in here give us faith and confidence as we go into the uncertainty of a new year to think God is greater than that uncertainty. If there are health concerns, if we're struggling with various issues at the moment, God, you are greater than all those things. You, can, you make mountains shake and we're safe in your hands. Lord, I pray now meet with any who need you. Lord, we pray for our dear friend John Simmons and we pray for Anne we know that, that uh, John's health is uh, struggling at the moment. Lord, watch over our brother, we pray. And Lord, anyone else as well who's struggling emotionally, mentally or physically with any kind of health conditions, Lord, we ask you to come near. Now, Lord, we want to speak healing into bodies. In Jesus' name, we, uh, we break the power of viral infections in lungs and bodies. In Jesus' name, we come against that sickness and we say, be well, be healed. Lord, raise up sons and daughters who are sick in the name of Jesus. And those in pain now, we speak to pain. We say, pain be gone in the name of Jesus. Let joints be well. Let muscles be strong. Let backs be right in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for those whose hearts are uh, troubled and full of sorrow today, then we pray, Lord, for the, the, the voice of the angels and the song of the angels to come into our uh, into our hearts, into our homes. Peace on earth. Let peace, let peace come into your home. In the name of Jesus, I speak the peace of God in your home, in your household, and in your workplace. Let peace come. And may you be a peace carrier, because you're there. May the people around you get more peace than they'd otherwise get. Carry peace into your workplace. Speak of the Prince of Peace. Testify of his goodness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our time is gone, friends, and so we're going to uh, close off uh, very shortly. We'll leave the, uh, 
the YouTube channel open just for a little while for you to uh, continue to chat if you want to. But thank you for joining with us and uh, God bless you all.